morning. morning. All the best morning. with single of you. <laughs> you haven't got your flowery shirt on today, Luca. No, um, probably in the wash. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have two of them, no? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I might actually. Now I've got loads of flowery shirts. This seems to be a white shirt day today, mainly. What is that? Yeah, what yeah, white, white shirt, blue buttons. Yeah. <laughs> Just to mix it up. <laughs> Morning, Alan. Morning, David. Are you well? Yeah, really good. It's beautiful. Being out cycling, amazing. <laughs> It's an incredibly beautiful day actually this morning, isn't it? My yeah. God, it's beautiful. So, I mean, yeah. If England was like life. this for, let's say, six months a year, you'd never want to go anywhere else, would you? I don't think we can. Good point. Morning, Phil. Well, we can actually morning. now. Yeah, we, we can, can go to Spain and Italy. Yeah, here we go. Oh. Can you go? Can you go to Italy now? Yep, Spain, Italy, France. Are you allowed? When you come back, do you have to still qualify? No. No. Oh, great. Mm. Um, allowed to. But I think the planes have to be half full. Do they not? Something like that. So the planes have to be socially distanced. I think so. <laughs> I, I guess they switch the air conditioning off. <laughs> Hi Isabel. Good morning. Are you good? I'm great, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Good. Morning everybody. Good morning. morning. We'll just wait Hello. one more minute for people just to sign on and then we'll we'll kick off. Hi Claire. Good morning. I am here just turning off video for bandwidth. Good morning everyone. Good morning. morning. Good morning. I can hear some beautiful birds in the background. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's me. Sorry, I'll mute it. No, don't worry. Don't worry. Hi, Janet. Good morning. All right. Good, thank you. Excellent. Okay, I think we'll kick off. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to mute everybody. Um, just so that um, we don't um, hear all the background noise. David, we are recording, yes? We are indeed, yes. Great. Okay, so... Um, Good morning, everybody, and a really warm welcome to the Business Owners Forum. And for those guys that haven't joined before, if it's your first one, let me explain a little bit about what it's all about. So the Business Owners Forum is a group of, I think we're over 100 business owners and execs now, who come together every couple of weeks just for 45 minutes, basically to learn and network. And obviously, in terms of learning, we know that the more we learn, the faster our business grows. And that's what we're mostly about, is about growing our businesses. So it's hosted by the Henley Coaching Partnership. So that's me. And we have another three coaches on the call today. So uh, Chris, why don't you say good morning to everyone? Good morning, David. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Joe Bentley. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. And also Nigel Nelms. Good morning, Nigel. Good morning, everybody. Now, it's also the other benefit, I think, of the, the forum is networking, because a lot of our business owners actually meet on the forum and do business together. So the best two ways to network are, first of all, use the chat box. Uh, you can connect with people on the chat box. Or you can use our Facebook group, which is a closed group where you can connect with people and chat with people on, on the Facebook group. Now every week we do something, or every couple of weeks we do something slightly different. We either have an interview with somebody, or we have a guest speaker, or we have a learning session. And today we're going to do a learning session. And the session, or the topic for the session today, is about recruiting superstars. So I'm just going to stop uh, sharing my screen here. 
Now, why have we chosen this topic? Or let me give you some context around the topic of recruiting superstars. Because all of you on the call today want to grow your businesses, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be on the call today. And for most of us, our unit of investment when it comes to growth is people. For most of us, it's not about factories or hotels or properties or machine tools. Our unit of investment is people. So let me give you an example. If, let's say, we recruit somebody that costs £60,000, that's an investment, and we want to increase our sales and profit by, well, the sales by about £180,000 at least, and our profit by £120,000. So we bought something for 60 and we sold it for 180 and we made 120,000 pound profit. So that's how most of us grow our business. We invest in people and turn that into money. So obviously the better you are at recruiting and retaining talent, the more money you're going to make and the faster you grow. But it's probably one of the hardest things we do in business is finding talented people that meet our culture and become productive and stay in our loyal it's tough and actually if i look at the clients that we coach those clients that have learned to do it brilliantly are definitely growing faster than those clients that struggle or or, or not great at it so learning how to recruit and find superstars is how you're going to get some real acceleration in the growth of your business and conversely, obviously we meet a lot of people, business owners in what we do as coaches. And I can tell you probably the inability to recruit and retain people is one of the biggest reasons why businesses stagnate and fail to grow. So it's a key thing as a business owner, can I get great at attracting and keeping talent? Because that's really a key function of growing businesses. But why talk about this now? Why talk about it in the middle of COVID? Why now? Well, the reason being is if you are confident in your business, and I know a lot of you are confident in your business proposition, now is a great time to recruit because there's more talent on the market today than there probably has been for the last 10 years. So if you've got the confidence to go find great talent, it's going to set you up for the next two or three years. But to do it well, you've got to have a system because it's only a system that produces good and consistent output. If we go and just buy on emotion, we're going to have a pretty low hit rate and it's going to be an expensive scenario. So what we're going to be talking about today is what is the system we can use to deliver outstanding results in attracting and retaining talent in terms of recruiting superstars. So that's going to be our subject today. And Nigel and Joe are going to take us through the system we use. So I'm going to hand you over to Nigel now. So Nigel, if you can share your screen and uh, I'm going to hand over to you. I'm disabled at the moment, David. Can you just give me permission? I will. You have now got permission, Nigel. Fantastic. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me and seeing me is not a big issue. So don't worry if you don't see me. Um, thank you, David. Uh, David's already talked about recruitment as being a huge investment that we make as, uh, as business owners um, and therefore there's a huge risk attached to recruiting great talent into your business. Um, as a bit of context setting I'm going to somewhat controversially kick off with why you shouldn't bother with this, why you shouldn't bother with um, getting great talent, just go and stick any old bum on a seat, that should that, that's uh, that's the alternative and here's why you shouldn't bother getting great talent it's going to involve you in more time these are not easy people to go out and find so it's going to take more time more of your time to go and find them it's probably going to cost you a bit more money to go and find great people as well because they don't grow on trees they're not readily available sometimes they're not actually looking for a job so actually finding them and getting them out of where they're currently employed comes with a cost attached to it. It's certainly not the easy option. Um, 
And interestingly, I, I think this is actually a reason why you should go for great talent. This is a pushback I get from several business owners. Well, if I go after really great people, they're going to leave me and go somewhere else eventually. Well, the converse is also true. If you recruit poor or average people, they just might stay with you. And what will that say about your business going forward? So I think the pros are probably quite obvious with that as a lead in. Um, great talent, just get it quicker. Um, they require far less management time because they get it quicker. And they will certainly reduce the risk of your investment, which is considerable uh, for most business owners um, in getting it wrong. Your business will grow faster with great talent, as David said, um, and ultimately you as the business owner will profit from that and you will grow faster. Don't take my word for it. There's a gentleman here that's built a huge employee centric business with a very, very strong commitment to recruitment. He does not compromise. He has never compromised, even from day one. I really like his, uh, his quote. So practically, what are the things that we can do? Because we're going to have to get really good at learning this skill if we're going to be brilliant business owners going forward. Now, there's two methodologies. Some of you will be very good at this naturally anyway. It's called the little black book approach. So connecting with great people and collecting their names and contact details, networking in groups like the Business Owners Forum gives you access to great people. Um, now, these aren't necessarily people that are going to join your organization. But great people have a habit of mixing with other great people. And when you come to look for those superstars that you want to recruit into your business, going to your little black book and getting referral is a really strong and smart thing to do. It doesn't cost a lot of time and effort, but you do have to dedicate uh, a, a discipline to approach this with a view to uh, populating your little black book going forward. The second area, I think David touched on this, was about building a system. Um, this is a system that needs to be rigorous and consistently applied, but something that will deliver you great results on a day in, day out basis whenever you're recruiting. We call it a 10 step process. Um, Joe's going to cover the, the last five steps. I'll cover the first five steps. There is some tailoring that can be done on an individual basis around these steps, but our strong guidance would be don't avoid any of these steps. Don't skip over any of them. Don't miss them out and think that you know better because this is about reducing the risk of recruiting the wrong person and therefore making a huge investment issue within your business. But the nice thing is this can be learned and this can be easily applied. Apologies to some of you because some of this might appear like teaching you to suck eggs, but it's where it's all captured in 10 steps that makes it really strong and powerful. And it's been proven time and time again. So this works. The first step is preparation. Your business is an important magnet for great people. But if you haven't put the time and effort into developing your mission, your vision, your values, then it's going to be very difficult to attract great people because you haven't actually enunciated or communicated clearly your business as being a great place to work. And what we're trying to do here all the way through this process is to recruit candidates that want to work for you rather than candidates just need a job. And at the moment, as David said, there is more supply on the employment market or the unemployment market than there's ever been. And therefore, there'll be a lot of people looking for jobs. But what you want with great talent is people that want to work for you. And preparation around this area is absolutely critical. The other area that's really important is how are you going to organize your resource to achieve that vision? And very importantly, show the candidates where they fit into your organizational structure. And so they can see with some clarity what it is that they're expected to do and where they will perform and sit within your organization. 
The other area is the job spec, and so many people miss, it out, miss this out. It is a very basic um, discipline, but it's essential discipline. Be crystal clear with the purpose of the role. Be crystal clear with what great looks like in performing the role. This will naturally deselect a lot of people who just are frightened off by the high standards, the crossbar that you've set for this particular role. And also be really clear about the non-negotiable essential experience that you want candidates to have in order to be superstars or potential superstars in the future doing the role that you're recruiting against. So with this great preparation in place, you're in an ideal position to go and start attracting great candidates. Now, great candidates, the objective here is to try and fill the swimming pool with a great number of options. Sorry, somebody's got their, uh, their microphone on. Can we possibly turn it off? Thank you. Um, so here it's about collecting options. And this is a really important task and a really important phase here because, again, we see time and time again that business owners meet the first person they like and they cut out the remaining eight steps of the process. They go, oh, well, I like him and I'll employ him. That comes with huge risk, him or her. That comes with huge risk. Tracking great talent can come from, or great candidates can come from a variety of sources. I'm sure you've all seen people posting up on LinkedIn. I've seen flashes and, and banners going across websites. There's obviously the defaults of great recruitment specialists that you can utilize. But an area often overlooked by business owners is speaking to the team that you've already got in place. They often know really good people that could go into that pool of talent. Customers and suppliers likewise. Um, I remember when I was building a team of customer facing uh, people um, and I only had one person in the team at the time, I went to the likes of Tesco and Sainsbury's, my major customers at the time, and asked them who was great from a customer facing perspective. And we got several great indications of people that we could put into our talent pool at that stage. The next stage, the third stage, sorry, there is somebody playing about on a keyboard. Can you please mute if possible? Thank you so much. The third stage is the telephone interview. This is naturally a deselection stage, but a lot of people fail to do this. Um, and it's a really efficient way for you as business owners to not spend your time in a series of one-to-one -one first stage interviews. Because let's face it, if we're sitting down with somebody that's come in to see us on a one-to-one -one basis, we're probably going to give them the minute, a minimum of 60 minutes of our time. A telephone interview allows you to cut through very quickly. 15, 20 minutes, absolute maximum. The intention here is to find the answers to three probing questions around their motivations. So why are you looking, sorry, why are you looking at this particular role? Um, suitability, where does this role fit with, um, with your ambitions? Uh, and why do you think you would be suitable in this role? And the third area is ambition. Where do you see yourself in three years? What part does this role play in that three-year ambition and vision that you have for yourself? Only if they are ticking the box on those three areas to your satisfaction, do you take them through to the next stage. But if they're a wrong candidate, the point is you've invested a maximum of 15 to 20 minutes of your time, and it's a very efficient way of getting through. The fourth stage, is the group interview. Now this is an ideal and a lot of people um, neglect to do, to do this, I think partly because of fear, partly because it requires some coordination, but it is an extremely efficient way, an insightful way to get background and detail on the candidates coming through the process. So you'll see them in a multiplicity of situations, you'll see them in quite a stress situation, you'll see them in group interaction, and that will show up and that will communicate an awful lot of information to you as a recruiter. So what does that look like? What does a group event look like in order to be run hugely effectively?
Well, the preparation that you've done up front about your company is the point that you should kick off with. This should be the meeting led by you, the business owner, talking about your business, your vision, kind of why it's a great business and why great people should be attracted to it. You then get into a group exercise and there is a one-to-one -one interview and very, very importantly, do not skip this stage, get your candidates to present to you the why me presentation. And it is literally why me. It will give you a great indication of how they interpret that question, how they frame their thoughts, how they communicate to you, how they present, and very importantly, their attention to detail. So many people do presentations with typing mistakes and uh, numbers that don't add up. Um, so this is a very telling element of the recruitment process. If, however, you don't do a group event, the next best thing would be a full interview day. But as you can see, if you've got three or four people that you bring in on full interview days versus a group event, you're spending three or four times the amount of time running these interview days. So again, if you value your time and your time is a premium, which I'm suspecting it is, the group event is the best way forward. Having said that, if you run the interview day, it runs very similarly to the group event, but instead of a group exercise, you're replacing that with a competency exercise. Having got people through that stage, and you will automatically deselect a whole bunch of people from the pool of candidates that have come in, you will then have a much more refined and select number of people that you're very interested in taking to the next stage. The next stage is what we call the discovery day, and this really acknowledges and tips our hat to the, uh, to the, to the fact that interviewing and recruitment is a two-way process. It has to fit you, the employer, as well as it has to, inf to fit the candidate, the potential employee. Without a win-win scenario here, you do not proceed and go further forward. I found this has worked extremely well in businesses that I've run, bringing people in for a full day. They get to see the environment in which they'll operate, they get to see the people that they will coordinate with and they get a general sense of that environment that ultimately will enable them to make a good decision about whether this is a company that is a great company and a good fit for me. But you as an employer will also get to observe them in a very different scenario from say the, the group interview situation. Here you're seeing how they interact with the rest of your team. And it's a great thing to do is a wash up event at the end of the day with your team to say, well, what did we think of that person? If they were to join the team, what do we think? What did they bring? Were there any problems? And again, it gets below the surface of the veneer that is often presented in uh, just a couple of stages of the recruitment process. But as I say, before you move on from this stage, make sure it's a tick box for the candidate and it's a tick box for the employee. I'm going to hand over to Joe at this stage, who's going to take us through the next five steps and talk through the relevance and the critical nature of the following five steps. Thanks, Nigel. OK, so we've really gone through and Nigel's gone through really nicely the actual processes that we go through, the stages through which you want to touch base with this person to find out if they're really fitting your organisation and are aligned with who you are and what, what your team is all about. Um, and where your future sits. Um, but there's things that we can do and we can go further to, to make sure that we are getting the right candidate, not just for the now, but like I say, for the future. Um, the person that could potentially be the MD when we go get our financial freedom and go do something else. So it's not just about the now, it's about the look forward. And one of the tools that you really need to be using if you're not, and I cannot stress this enough, is the DISC profile, which is an unbelievable psychometric tool. And in my opinion, it goes way beyond any other psychometric tool that I have ever used and I've used a lot. And what it does is it broadly categorizes each person into four categories. And like any tool like this, you can be a little bit of one and a little bit of the other, and that's absolutely fine. But what it does is it really gives you a good understanding 
and a different window through which you can form your opinion. So how are we judging and forming our opinion of is this person the right person for the job and for the business? And what it does, it really outlines four things and, and I'd write these down. So the first thing it tells you about is their behavioral style in a working environment and it talks about their pace. Are they fast paced or are they working naturally at a slower pace? What suits them and what fits them naturally? And you'll know with your environment and your business, you know, is it a fast paced environment? Is it pressured? Are there deadlines? Are they going to cut it or not? The second thing that it really gives you an idea about is their priority. So what are they going to prioritize? It gives you a little um, insight into their into their inner workings of if there's a list of things to do, what are they naturally going to go towards? And you'll find again, is that going to fit with the job spec as well as the business objectives? The third thing that it gives you a really good light on is their style, their working style. And this is really good, not just for the business internally, but who are your clients? What is their preferred style? Are they really sociable beings that love connecting? Um, and have transparency um, and get on well with people or are they more of a dominant person or a compliance that works at the steadier pace um, and likes to just get the results so where do they fit are they going to bond with your team and your clients um, or, are, or actually are they not quite right for you today and then the last thing that you need to write down that the disc profile highlights to us is their tendencies and these are those subtle things that can kind of drive us crazy or we absolutely love. Um, and it gives you a whole list of different characteristics. It also tells us about people's weaknesses. So if we do recruit someone, it really gives us the heads up on, okay, how do I need to manage this person? What do I need to watch out for? And what do I need to kind of drill down and, and get rid of before we kind of go to that next level? So I think I've kind of told you how great the disc profile is, but it just also highlights the consistency with you and your vision. So don't ever disregard your needs as the business owner, because they are going to be working very closely with you and spending a lot of time with you. So is that, kind of, is that the kind of person that motivates you? Would they be a good support for you? Would they be transparent and open and high energy? Is that what you need? So it's looking at it at uh, all angles, but an absolutely amazing tool for you to run on yourself, for your self-awareness, as well as your awareness for your team. Thanks, Nigel. If we could go to the next one. Just back one would be great. Thank you. Okay, and so the next tool that we really want to be using is what we call the iceberg. If we could bring that up fully on screen that is up on screen great so it's the iceberg so how do you truly get to know someone before you take them on it's quite a superficial environment that we're in they're very prepared on their answers they're preempting your questions you might be a little bit more formal it's not an actual working environment so how do you get to truly understand if someone is going to jump on board and help drive your business forward and align with your vision that you've sat there and thought about and invested in and how do you know that whether they're going to sit by your side and push that business forward alongside you or whether they're just not that type and the difficult thing for us is that we only see what's on the surface so we only see what they present and that can be quite contrived and quite controlled so how do we get to know what's underneath that sits in their core that actually drives all of our actions, behaviors, and decisions. How do we get to know that? And we describe it a little bit like an iceberg. You see 10% above the water, but the 90% mass underneath is the thing that's gonna dictate whether they are right for you or not. And what we encourage here is that you take that person, that candidate, and you take them out of the work environment and you put them into a more social, relaxed, informal environment, because that's where you're gonna get the little nuggets to say, oh, they're a little bit like that in that scenario. They weren't too great like this. I love them when they said that. And you get to know the four things that sit underneath the iceberg that are critical to finding the right business, 
person for you in your business. And those four things are their skills. So what they're actually good at, what they can actually do. But the thing, the powerful thing that sits underneath that is their belief system. What do they believe? What do they think to be true? What do they think to be the right way to go about things? What have they learned and picked up? What environments have they been in where they think this is the way to do it? And does that fit with your business? The next thing that's even more fundamental than beliefs is their values. What do they truly value as a person? And what is their priority? Is it results or is it people relationships? It's really good to get that insight because like I say, it drives their actions, decisions and behaviors. And the biggest thing that drives those three things is what they see as their identity, who they are, where they've grown up, what they've learned from a very young age. And that's something that can show a lot about a person because often if we start to see things at the identity level, that's the hardest thing to change about someone. And it wouldn't be right for them to take the job or for us to take them on because it will just cause conflict, discord, and probably a lot of stress. So if this is really a two-way thing. It's really important to get that insight in that informal and relaxed environment to see what they're about. And you can pick that up a lot through their language. You get, you get an idea of their attitudes. But it's also really important, as Nigel said at the beginning, for us to be super clear on what our values are and what we stand by and what is non-negotiable. And then it is a two-way process. They'll either realize the job is not for them or will realize the job is not for them. But it has to be a two-way thing and being super clear on that is super important. Thanks, Nigel, if you could go through to the next one. Okay, so we've done all this interviewing, we've done telephones, social, they've met the other half, we've done group interviews. What's the next step? Well, unless you have a real affliction and you know it's not right, we get to this level and this is what we look at as the scorecard. And this is something that we would encourage you to actually actively have written down or in the form of a document. It has to be objective and tangible. So we all have an unconscious bias, right? Okay, we all kind of like, like people that are like ourselves and there is always gonna be an emotional pull towards that person and the amount of business owners that I meet that have recruited badly because they like that person or they felt for that person, or they saw a bit of them in them, okay? And if you're, you're, if you're recruiting on an emotional level, you're doing it wrong. Super clear, super objective. Four questions that you need to put on your scorecard. Are they a cultural fit for you? And if you don't really know and haven't refined what your culture is, do it. Because you're not gonna recruit the right people if you don't know what your own culture is. Do they have the competency to get the results you need? Do they have the tenacity? Do they have the fire? Are they gonna push on? Number three, do they have the right motive to make this move? Why do they really want this job? Are they just needing a job? Are they just needing money? Is it just a stepping stone from them? And that really goes back to Nigel's why me? But why do they need it? And that's really looking at the iceberg, you know, have they really made it clear that this is really important and that their values and your values align? Because when those two things do align, it's magic. And even if the salary isn't that great, you're gonna get that person on board because it floats their boat and they're gonna get job fulfillment and satisfaction. And the last thing you really wanna be thinking about and assessing is do they bring something extra to the team that we don't have, already have? Do they bring something extraordinary? Can they make my business even better than it is right now? Are they gonna have ideas that I don't have? Do they have skills that I don't have? Because having a, a varied team with different thinking and, and behavioral patterns and styles can make your business even better than it is today. Thanks Nigel, next slide please. This is a stage that lots of people tend to skip, and we're gonna tell you never skip this step. References. 
So it's one of those things, isn't it? You know, you're kind of like the person, you've done your scorecard, you've done your interviews. Oh, let me just touch base with someone that they've worked with just to sound them out a little bit or let me just get that standard letter that comes from HR now that just says, I, you know, I confirm they did work with me between 2007 and 2014. This is where you're going to get even greater insight from someone else. And it seems like it's a big ask, but we would say go for four to five references and references that you can speak to. You are going to get so much more from a conversation than you're going to get in a crafted email or letter. Okay. Everything that they've, they've shown you to date can then be verified. And this is giving that person or you a 360 of, of what that person is really like. So never ever skip this stage. And I just want you to write down these two questions, vital questions. Number one, do you think this is the right job for? Okay. And in this, in this conversation, how you really want to set it up is that they've already got the job. You know, this isn't a test. You want to make the other person feel kind of relaxed, like they're your pal. I'm a business owner. You're a business owner. You've employed X. I'm going to employ X. Do you think that he or she is right for the job? Okay. And just by having that relaxed approach, they're going to tell you far more. And the second question I want you to write down is, could you give me a few clues on how to best manage them? And this is a great question and have it word perfect, write the actual question down as I said it. Could you give me a few clues on how to best manage, manage them? Because there's a presupposition in that sentence that says they're not great at everything. They are gonna kind of go one way and I'm gonna have to pull them in. As a business owner, could you give me the heads up on how to manage them? And so much more is gonna come out. And that will then help form your opinion. Are they right for me and my, and my business? Could we, could we move to the next one, Nigel? And then lastly, which kind of gets forgotten sometimes, and I just want to really highlight that as part of the onboarding or the recruitment process, we can't just then bring someone into the business and leave them. It's the next stage that is super, super important. It's the embedding of everything you've said in those conversations and it's bringing it to life. It's taking theory into practice. And if you don't do that, things are gonna fall by the wayside. So how do great teams make history? When we look at the original Apple team or we look at NASA, what is it about those teams that make history, that achieve things that haven't been achieved before? While team dynamics plays a huge part in pushing people past average into exceptional. And it's not just about the one person you're recruiting, it's about the whole team gelling and moving your business forward for you. So start as you mean to go on, hire slow and fire fast. And there's four stages that you wanna take your new employee and your team through. Forming, storming, norming, performing. And I'll just go light on this, but the forming is the initial impression. It's that initial relationship that you're building, the initial ideas. Storming. Storming is where you get to that stage where you start to work together. There's a little bit of conflict. There's a little bit of disagreement, different views. But carry your people through that together. Facilitate it. Don't leave them on their own. We need difference of opinion. We need different ideas. We need different behavioral styles, but make sure that it's done smoothly. Norman, Norman is where they, the team get used to each other. They really respect each other's ideas. They respect that there's a different approach to different things and they're not always right. And that's where the beauty starts to show. And once you start doing that enough, you get to performing and that's where you see the high, high performing teams. So Richard Branson says, clients do not come first, employees come first. If you take care of your employees, they will take care of the clients. So when you do on board, take care of your people. And just to end on a little quote from Robert Bosch, who runs a 60 billion 
pound company with 400,000 employees. I don't pay good wages because I have a lot of money. I have a lot of money because I pay good wages. And what he means by that is I recruit good people. I'm prepared to invest in my people because I know I will get the return from those people. Okay, David, I can hand it back over to you and I think we can go to Q&A. Fantastic, thank you, Joe. Um, Nigel, can you just stop uh, the screen share so we can see people's faces? That'd be great. Um, and invite anybody on the call to um, ask any questions. Uh, Nick, go ahead, Nick. Really interesting presentation. Um, a lot of my business model is based around self-employed, recruiting self-employed people. And so how much would that differ? How much of that process would be changed if we're looking to recruit self-employed people rather than salaried staff? Uh, let me take that one because I'm quite passionate about this, is that actually it shouldn't change at all because it doesn't make any difference what the contractual relationship is between you guys. Because at the end of the day, you want exactly the same thing. You want the same commitment. You want the same level of performance. You want the same value set. So it really doesn't make any difference. I'd use exactly the same system, Nick. Exactly the same system. Interesting. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Um, Chris. A question? Chris, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Very useful. Um, there's a bit of challenge at the moment. All, all my offices are closed and they're probably going to be closed based on legal and HR advice until September. Um, during that time, I want to hire about, about 12 people. So um, I think we've, we've got to sort of adjust some of these steps um, to take account of the fact that they can't come to the office um, or that you can't do face-to-face -face type interviews. So it, it, any advice or, or thoughts on, uh, on coping, coping during lockdown and office closures? Yeah, and yeah. Sorry, sorry, Nigel, just to echo that, Nikki Paul has put something of a similar vein in the chat. She's okay. got no camera, but any guidance on particular things to consider if your business is largely remote working, i.e. onboarding them? It's a, it's a great question, Chris. Um, and I think you're right that there is some adaption that's uh, adaptation that's needed of that process to, to work with uh, remote working circumstances. But I think the majority of you, and correct me if I'm wrong, are running group Zoom meetings, which again, it's very possible to, uh, to bring a candidate into that and give them a sense of the sorts of things you do. I think a lot of business owners that I'm seeing are also doing uh, the social events on Zoom with their, um, with their teams as well. And again, this gives you a great opportunity to see them, not in the, the full benefit of a, a physical uh, position, but in the best possible scenario that you're facing at the moment, which is operating in a, in a remote world. Um, that would be my build. Joe, would you, would you have any, uh, adds to that? Yeah, I think it's difficult. I, I, I do agree though. And I think that, you know, getting the team involved and maybe even having some one-to-ones with the team. I know, you know, Google and Apple, they don't let anyone join unless everyone through that process of interviewing is happy with it. So the more opinions, the better. I would definitely, definitely get that disc profile sent over to them because before you meet them, you're already going to find out stuff about them and you're already a step ahead because you can then match what they're saying with is actually is this matching with what you know what the tool says about their tendency and their style um if that helps i think the other thing i'd add chris as well is it's, it's naturally going to take more time yeah because it's not as efficient on zoom and remote as it is in a let's say a group interview so i think if you want to recruit well you just have to dedicate more time to it in order to get a good result yeah thanks and um I, i've noticed more more no's um, recently than yeses so um, the candidate failure rate is going up um, I've only observed this the last few days it was by looking back at the data so I'll, I'll feed back if we get any insights from that but um, yeah it seems to be harder to get to the point where we're all agreed that we hire a candidate I'm not sure whether it's COVID related or economy or whatever it might be but um, that's interesting it's probably a good thing Chris definitely yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a great believer. And if in doubt, or if any of my team members are in doubt, you don't hire. Yeah, 100%.
Have you changed anything in your uh, recruitment process, Chris, that may be leading to some more no's? Because um, we talk about deselection as being a, a very efficient way of managing the recruitment process because you want people that are, you know, despite what you put in front of them, despite the challenges, still really want to work for you. So getting the no's, as David said, is no bad thing. And I think Jeff Bezos says exactly the same thing in his opening statement. Yeah, I think one thing that the stakes are higher, right? You know, so a, a wrong hire is going to hurt you even more now than pre-COVID. So, you know, we yeah, that, that's probably what's driving some of this. Great. Well, we've got, I think, time just for question. one last question. Um, yep. Should we go to Tash, maybe? Or okay. sorry. Mine will be very quick. Um, the just profiling that Joe and you spoke about, David, where can we get hold of something like that so that we can start encouraging um, these uh, people to do them? them out you can just contact any one of us and we'll do them for you tash so okay. it's either david chris joe or nigel at the henley coaching partnership.com perfect thank you one last one because i know tom tom was desperate to ask questions so tom go for it hey can you hear me yeah 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 good um yeah just on um hiring people um so something i've been looking at personally is kind of trying to develop the, the stock that i have staff including myself and um include uh, improving our performance and one of the things i found really useful that i'd like to share is um this neurological dominance test um it, it enables people to kind of identify their um their, their neurological dominance and then also adjust for any kind of issues that they have i found it really good at sort of optimizing people's performance so I just wanted to throw that out there. Hey, Tom, that's really good. I, I've seen that test and I think it is really useful. Are you happy to share the details on, on the Facebook group so everyone can have a, have a look at it? Sure, yeah, I've just posted it on here as well, but um, yeah, you can just go that. online and it's just a um, yeah, multi-choice one, but yeah, I've, everyone I've showed it to has found it really useful. Brilliant, Tom, thanks so much for sharing. Um, Luca, I know you were desperate as well. One last one, I think. Go for it. Yeah, I, IQ tests. Uh, IQ is the biggest single predictor of um, success in any individual. Do we go there? Do people go there? Um, I, I contest that that is true. Um, actually, everything I've seen that says emotional intelligence is a much bigger predictor than, than intellectual intelligence. Uh, but that's a big subject. So uh, I don't think we could do justice for that today. <laughs> Um, but but you clearly you, you do need to get a, a grip of both IQ and EQ uh, before you employ for various jobs. So some jobs are very IQ driven, some are very EQ driven, and you need to understand the shape of them. Cool. Listen, it's um, it's just gone quarter past ten, and I know all of you want to go and grow businesses and also the sun's shining as well and it's friday so thank you so much for joining us um we'll be on in two weeks time with another subject i think we've got a, an interview uh in two weeks time so please join us for that uh thanks very much and have a fantastic weekend everybody and thank you very much nigel and joe for the great presentation really enjoyed it thanks guys thank you thanks. bye thanks very much